Um, just to give a brief plug, one of the cool things that we like to be able to say that we do in the Science and Religion program at Biola is sort of the little motto there, to be able to say, I'm a Christian and a scientist. Not a Christian scientist, because that's that weird <laughs> cult, but, um, but I haven't thrown my brains out the door, which is the normal reaction I get. You know, it's like, gee, I thought scientists were smart. What happened to you? You know, because you're a Christian. So, so that kind of thing is very common out there. Well, this evening we're looking at archaeology. I should give you a, kind of the textbook definition for what exactly archaeology is. Basically, what we're trying to do is to study past human life as we can, can put the pieces back together through the artifacts that are left behind by ancient peoples. So that's your textbook definition of what one does as an archaeologist, look for artifacts left behind by ancient peoples. In reality, what uh, archaeology is, is uh, digging up trash, <laughs> graves, grave robbing, and uh, looking at burned out cities. So, so it's, uh, that's the more realistic picture of what's going on. What makes it so interesting is you have no idea what you're going to find next in it. It really is the, the luck or the providence of the draw in terms of what you're able to recover. So one of the things when I teach a class in archaeology, I, I give as an, as an assignment is to say, OK, just to think about what you might be able to recover. Um, just walk through your house or your dorm room or something like that and make a list of things that you might be able to recover. And then to uh, actually you know, do the assignment, what you have to think of is, OK, what's going to survive looting and a major fire? OK. Then for extra credit, I offer that uh, for the students to actually do. You know, burn your house down. <laughs> burn your house down. Have, have, have the neighborhood gang come through, both, both before and after you loot, you know, you, you burn it and pick up what's left. Then, then stir in a couple of earthquakes, which makes it you know, easy to do here in Southern California, add a couple of earthquakes to it. And then here's the part that's tough. No one ever really takes me up on it because they have to bury it for 3,000 years, and I can't, I can't guarantee that I'll be around to grade them you know, for, for how successful they are. And, and this is really the issue, is, is that you're looking at things that really have been buried for thousands of years that have rotted and rusted and decayed away. And, and the only reason there's really anything left is because of the nature of the materials that people we're building with or writing on, which is generally stone or clay. Those are the things that survive fairly well. The artifacts here are actually a colonial American, uh, only three or 400 years old, and some broken ceramics, uh, heavily corroded metals, fired brick, and things like that are all that survived just 300 years. Add another factor of 10 to it, and it's really amazing that anything's left in the ancient Near East. The, the one thing that does help is that it's dry in most places. And moisture is the major enemy of artifacts. So uh, if you can keep it dry, you can usually do OK. Ed Yamauchi has a book called The Stones and the Scriptures, which is a very excellent book. It's out of print. But he surveys this and says, really, what you're doing in archaeology is you're able to recover a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the things that were available at the time. So, so you know, of all the things that were there, only a fraction survives the looting and the burning and all of that. Then only a fraction survives the 3,000 years of rot and decay. And then of that, only a fraction happens to be discovered again. So, so you really are looking at a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of things. And thus, what you end up with is, is this situation. What could you reasonably expect to find <laughs> Um, well, well, if I can be more clear than that, I'd say nothing. You know, literally nothing is what you kind of go out there expecting to find. And this is why one of the mantras in archaeology is that absence of evidence, you know, if you can't find anything, that does not prove that nothing happened. All it proves is that you haven't found anything. So absence of evidence is not evidence of absence when one is trying to reconstruct history or cultures from the ancient past. And really what you're dealing with, the picture I like to think of is a thousand piece puzzle of which you find four pieces. You know, it's just, you know, can you even find two that connect to each other is, is the difficulty. And, and then where do you put the pieces on the overall picture of what you're trying to reconstruct? 
Archaeology is that fraction of a fraction of a fraction, just a couple puzzle pieces from cultures that lived thousands of years ago. How in the world can you put something together uh, that, that's helpful? So again, you've seen the movies and all of that. That's a little bit idealistic to expect that you can recover things like this. Usually, you're, you're pretty lucky to find broken pottery, <laughs> things like that. That, that, that. That's pretty easy. And one of the real problems is, is you make your good discoveries the afternoon of the last day of your dig. So, so you do an all-nighter to pull out what you can and maybe hope you get funding to come back in two or three years and then continue digging there again. So, so the real issue you face in archaeology is, you know, why are people crazy enough to do it, you know? What turns professors into archaeologists? And you know, you're going out very often in the third world conditions, very rough and dangerous conditions <laughs> to having to deal with. So, so, so why, people would, <laughs> why people would do this at all? You know, I, at least I've got a little better technology to, to, to work with. But, but the reason you do it is because when you discover something, it really is, is what can I say, life-changing. Uh, I've, I've read people's obituaries where in their obituary is, I was at this site when we discovered X, you know, just some huge find. And, and the finds that you do f come across every once in a while are incredible. This was discovered in a crypt, a hermetically sealed um, stone-lined crypt beside the Great Pyramids in Egypt. And it's the, uh, the yacht for the pharaoh uh, to cruise on the Nile with his, serp with his uh, servants. And again, it was the, the boat kit was what was you know, preserved there. Again, 4,000 years old. The wood is actually, is actually uh, decomposing now that it's on public display. But um, nevertheless, just to find something like that is incredible. Um, other things that you get are this faience uh, glass vessel here for holding perfume or something like that. You just will come across these things that are absolutely gorgeous to uh, find, especially when you realize they've been preserved for thousands of years. Well, our issue here is, is to look at archaeology and how that relates to the Bible. And as, as JP was kind of introducing the topic, um, the reliability of the Bible is one of the things that's part of the life of the mind in the church and in the academic world. And really, it's interesting, you look back not very far, issues regarding the reliability of the Bible weren't, weren't on any front pages of anything. It really did not develop until the late 1700s with the rise of the Enlightenment movement and humanism and so on, which felt and argued that um, human reason is able to judge truth. And what's right and wrong, um, and we can establish rationally uh, experience, the uniform experience uh, that people have. We can use to judge whether things are true or false, whether they happened or not, or are likely to have happened or not. So the Enlightenment felt it had the ability to judge things like the trustworthiness of the scriptures. And in one sense, you know, that's not a bad idea to have some reservation and say, I just don't want to believe it because other people have believed it. I'd really like there to be some basis for, uh, for my beliefs. But the way reason and experience cashed out in culture were in two very interesting ways. One was to say, well, by sake of reason, we can discount any supernatural intervention. Because after all, that would break the laws of nature. If God did a miracle or something like that, conservation of energy would be broken. So we can just rule out any idea of supernatural intervention uh, because that would break the regularities of nature. So reason is used to discount that possibility. And then miracles can be excluded because in our human experience today, we don't see any. So, so reason and experience are used to discount two rather important things that the Bible tells us about, that God spoke to people or that God did things like miracles. And if you're familiar with like the Jefferson Bible, the Thomas Jefferson's version of the Bible, uh, he was a deist. Anything where an intervention or miracle would take place was nicely edited out of his edition. So that's the Enlightenment thinking. And against that idea, uh, many aspects of Bible history get eliminated basically by definition. 
we know those things could not have happened based on our experience and our trust of human reason today. And, and this then makes it very difficult to take on skeptics if you're going to you know, buy too much of the God can't intervene because that would break laws of nature sort of situations. So it's the rise of humanism, the enlightenment that started to challenge the Bible on a number of issues, and this carries on today. I want to spend a little time giving you some background in where archaeology is at today. So if you pick up some archaeology, archaeology journals or something, you have a feel for what their background is. Herschel Shanks, editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, fairly popular level, but, but reasonably good uh, archaeology journal, has, has written on this and basically divided the archaeology community into what he calls the minimalists and the maximalists. And the minimalists are the critical scholars, the liberal scholars, basically would argue that, well, let me go on to who the other, who the maximalists are, the uh, traditional biblical scholars he would put on the other side of this wall, if you will, and we'll see what the wall is. Basically, the critical scholars are the secular archaeologists. Uh, they might be postmodernist as well. And for them, the Bible is just a collection of Hebrew traditions. Uh, nothing in there that they, that they would expect to be history. Again, what can pass the test of reason and experience? Uh, the liberal scholars would tend to have a more religious or see a spiritual value to the Bible, but again, would discount any historical aspects to it. The traditional biblical scholars would, would place the Bible on a, a more trustworthy footing and say, again, I'm not sure that every maximalist would call the Bible an inspired historical account, but they would feel that the Bible would be a, a trustworthy record of historical data from Old and New Testament times. So, so these are kind of the, the, the two divisions one finds among archaeologists today, the minimalists and the maximalists. And, and how this cashes out is that the minimalists would tend to, again, by a priori reasons, say, well, there, there just can't be any miracles in past history because you know, those sorts of things don't happen, where the maximalists would be open to that idea. Not that there's a miracle under every rock or something like that, but, but if we find reasonable evidence for a miracle, that's okay. Minimalists also tend to come to the Bible looking for discrepancies. Okay, it's just the expectation that what we find there is not going to have anything that, that uh, corresponds to what we discover in the archaeological record, as fragmentary as that is, where the maximalists would tend to go, well, if this is reliable history, then I'd expect to see a cooperation with what archaeological data we recover. And when I went into, uh, I ended up in ancient Near Eastern studies because I was first going into Old Testament studies, and this was the attitude that I saw in that discipline, that, that the Bible, by definition, is wrong. Unless one finds extra-biblical evidence that corroborates some aspect of the text. Just this presumption of guilt and less proven innocence was how the minimalists in Old Testament studies, again, in the liberal critical side of uh, theology, tends to be treated. So what I decided to do was, well, go into ancient Near Eastern studies where we study the extra biblical things and look for artifacts and inscriptions more directly, again, from the surrounding cultures around, around Israel. The maximalists would tend to go in the direction of, well, you know, if I don't find evidence, I'll uh, give the text the benefit of the doubt. And if I find a discrepancy, again, there's a lot of weird things that one discovers in history. Um, real history is much more complex than any recorded narrative of historical events will be. So the maximalists will tend to be on the side of giving the Bible the benefit of the doubt. The minimalists will be on the side of of again looking for discrepancies, um, only kind of grudgingly granting something in the Bible is true if the outside evidence for it really seems to warrant that. What has really driven Herschel Shanks crazy though is to see the minimalists become even more minimal over the past 20 years or so. Um, if an archeological find is judged by a minimalist to be too good to be true, then oh, it must be a forgery. 
And there's a number of things out there where you see minimalists going, you know, I don't like that conclusion from the data, so it must be a forged artifact, or there must be some alternative interpretation for it, or it must be dated to some other period uh, other than the time period where it would actually corroborate the, the biblical data. So, so um, again, the, the minimalist seems to be a skepticism far more strong than, than seems to be necessary for good scholarly work, I would say. Well, in this climate where you have a very significant skepticism dominating uh, most departments of archaeology and maximalists out there as well working, one of the real questions you can ask is, okay, well, what can archaeology, ar yeah, I'll say the word right, what can archaeology be expected to confirm? And for one thing, you, you can't prove the Bible with it. Okay, again, you've only got, you know, a few puzzle pieces out of a thousand that we've actually recovered. And that's not enough to prove every verse and every line in the Bible. But, but what can you show from archaeology so that the general historical setting and the cultures that are portrayed there are realistically portrayed. You, you get a good sense for the, the history from Old Testament and New Testament times when you do archaeology. You're, you're able in very, some very interesting ways to find things that sort of fill in the cracks about the cultural innuendos in how people are interacting with each other. Um, you learn things from history that, that aren't talked about in the Bible but fit with the reigns of kings and so on that we are familiar with. And every once in a while you discover something that's really kind of cool, like some specific individual from Bible times shows up. One of the most impressive ones in this category was found in the City of David excavations about 20, 30 years ago. It's a clay bulla. It's about the size of a dime or so, and this is a, used as a seal um, on a papyrus or a vellum scroll, and this was a scroll recovered from elephantine that was intact. You see the, the papyrus rolled, it's tied, and then a piece of clay is pressed over the knot of the string, or pressed over the string, and then the, the signet ring of the person is pressed into the soft clay, the clay dries, and now you have a, a sealed document. You, know, you, you can't open that thing up and tamper with it without breaking the seal. This is a common way to, uh, again, seal and verify uh, legal documents, uh, again, for thousands of years. Now we use wax seals or we impress the paper with a stamp, that sort of a thing. City of David excavations, are, they are, are working in, in one of the houses there, and they come across this seal in addition to several others. And this one's, again, intact enough that you can read it very nicely. It says, Baruch, the son of Neriah, the scribe. And the um, archaeologist that, that was the first one to pick this up and read it, he just said that I just, I just paused over this one because this is the guy who was the scribe for Jeremiah, right, about 600 BC or so, who's, 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 who's writing out the book of Jeremiah for, for the prophet. I'm holding a piece of clay here that he touched, that's his signet ring. I mean, it, it, just, it just brings it to life. This guy was real. Um, so, so that's one of the things that, that, that archaeology does. It, it, it fills in these cracks in incredible ways. It's like, wow, these, these people were real. You know, I'm holding in my hand the actual same thing that, that Baruch did. So that becomes one of the interesting things that sometimes archaeology is able to confirm very specific things, very specific people, sometimes very specific events. Usually there are wars or major things that are affecting the whole country. But can archaeology confirm miracles? Well, well, there the problem is, is to scratch your head over, well, what evidence would be left behind from Lazarus being raised from the dead? Hmm. Let's see, the body's no longer in the tomb, and he, he presumably died again. So, so you know, if you start, if you start, working, start working through some of these things, you really hit issues. Uh, for example, you know, crossing the Red Sea. I, 
So on a committee that was trying to wrestle with this, you know, if we did look for where Israel crossed the Red Sea, what kind of artifacts would you find? And, and basically your best hope was to find some uh, Egyptian beads. You know, if, if, the, uh, if the Israelites acquired um, jewelry from the Egyptians and some of it broke as they were crossing, uh, you might be able to recover some of that from the shore. So, so again, the, the, the types of things that you could expect to recover from some of these events in the Bible, really, you know, there's really not that much there that one would actually expect to be able to find again. But what's stunning is, is that you find what, what some archaeologists call the throwaway details. You have a historical account where it mentions, um, and one of the most recent ones here that was rather cool, was uh, guys working in the British Museum cataloging some various texts there, and he picks up this small tablet. It's a receipt from the temple in Babylon, and it mentions the guy who gave his gift. It's, it's Nebuchadnezzar Shakim, who's the chief officer gives his title and his name. And, and the, the guy reading this goes, good grief, this is one of the chief officers that was there with Nebuchadnezzar at the fall of Jerusalem. And this is a few years later, he's making a gift to the temple, and the Bible's got his name, his rank, his serial number recorded right there in the book of Jeremiah. So just a throwaway detail, you know, if you're faking history, you know, you invent a bunch of names for people and their positions, and then you find a guy, um, that's just an interesting aspect of, you might not be able to confirm the major aspects, but the characters you can identify and you find, um, their titles, their names preserved correctly. So one of the things that I find in archeology span is that same sense that that epigrapher had holding Baruch's um, seal, you get this sense from, from working with this for a while these people were real. These things were real. You know, I'm not just reading fairy tales here, Hansel and Gretel and so on. It's like, no, these, you know, these people were real. And, and, and it, 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 again, it's a hard sense to say, well, objectively, I can list this, this, and this reason. I mean, I can list this, this, and this artifact quite well. But you get this impression of the Bible starts coming to life you know, as, as real history, not just some interesting events. So, so again, that sense is a bit hard to quantify. What I want to look at this evening is, is, I think, a fairer question to ask. Given the minimalists and maximalists out there, um, just how reliable is the Bible turning out to be compared to those skeptics' approach that one finds based on reason and experience that the Bible is just myth, None of this stuff is real history, it's all invented history to give Israel a sense of the past. Um, just how reliable is the Bible compared to the skeptics approach as opposed to the Bible's own sense of these are real things that happened. And then just a second question I won't look at tonight, but it's uh, how reliable is the Bible uh, as confirmed by archeology span compared to what one finds from other religious works. And the Book of Mormon is a fun one to do some archeology, span North American archeology span on to uh, just see how that does not hold up at any level like the Bible does. Well, again, the title of the talk was, you know, what are some of the, the top highlights of uh, things found uh, from the world of archeology? span So let me give you, um, again, some of the highlights from that. One of the, things that still shows up on top 10 archeological finds is this one that goes all the way back to 1846. Okay, this is the very beginning of archeology span in the ancient Near East. Um, A.H. Laird is, uh, again, a, a British embassy person there working in the areas of Iraq today. He starts looking around in Nimrod, Kalads in the area of uh, around, the, uh, around the term will come to be Mosul is where this is close to today. He discovers this stone artifact and this records as a historical fact, Shalmaneser's campaigns into the West, into Syria and Judah and so on in 841 BC. 
again, this is in a climate of uh, skepticism at the time, where some people were saying that, well, Assyria and Babylon did not really seriously exist. They were just inventions. Um, certainly Israel was an invention. You know, the nation Israel never really existed. And on the uh, side of this is, uh, again, you can kind of see the depictions here, 20 different scenes of uh, places that he visited on his campaign where people are giving him tribute. Uh, yeah, the Assyrian method of, uh, of collecting taxes was to uh, pull up in your chariot and say, uh, bring out all your best stuff or I'll burn your city down. Okay, so, so generally people who didn't want to put up a fight would just bring out their best stuff. And one of the things that uh, is portrayed on this, this shows it pretty well. You guys can all read the top line there, <laughs> right? <laughs> Biltush, uh, let's see, Yahua Dumu Ha'umri. They, they, they don't teach this? <laughs> what, what's going on with public schools here? They, they just, they, man, we're losing our ability to read cuneiform. Anyhow, <laughs> so, but, but basically the picture here is, is uh, Shalmaneser is the guy standing there. His gods are the, the uh, above there, shining down, smiling on him. The guy kissing his feet is Jehu, bringing tribute. Uh, Jehu, the son of Omri, bringing tribute to Shalmaneser III. And you go, Jehu, Jehu. Duh, well, he's obviously this king of Israel. And this is the, the earliest picture that we have of an Israelite king. And the skeptics at the time in face of this are like, oh, well, I guess uh, the nation of Israel must have really existed. And that not Jehu who drove a chariot like a, like a madman, um, well, that's not shown here, but, but he obviously existed as did Omri as well. So again, this sense of, the, this is not told us in the Bible would have been embarrassing for Jehu to recount this, but nevertheless, this is one of those fill in the cracks. These are real historical people interacting with thugs, uh, otherwise known as kings, um, <laughs> from Assyria, but nevertheless, you know, gee, he really existed. Um, and and uh, kind of knew when to kiss the feet of the right person. So, so this is one of the things that one finds, uh, is that, again, the skeptics have been very brutal at attacking aspects of uh, ancient Judean, ancient Israelite history. This is one example. C.C. Tory of Yale was not R.A. Tory of Biola. I need to clarify that. Uh, but again, late in the 19th century and our 20th century, a number of scholars tried to discredit the biblical accounts of the Babylonian attack on Judah and the subsequent exile. Okay, those, those were just myths and legends that the Jewish people made up. They were never really hauled off into captivity by anybody like this. And again, so Chronicles, Ezra, Ezekiel, and even Jeremiah are, are being rewritten. These later historical books are being rewritten because, well, we just can't believe that the kings would do things like that. You know, massive exportation of populations across thousands of miles and so on, those sorts of things. And one of the things that, that Tori based this on was that the prophet Ezekiel is, is uh, giving various revelations from God based on not the dates of Zedekiah, the local king there in Jerusalem, but based on a King Jehoiakim who was in captivity over in Babylon. And, and Tori goes, this, this is crazy just to, you know, no, no one dates, you know, their, their, their calendar based on some king who's off in captivity any place besides that. Choyakim wouldn't have been called a king after all because he'd been taken captive. So, so again, the skepticism, just doubting any aspect of the history of uh, Judah at this point, um, had a rude awakening when the Germans started to excavate in Babylon proper and they're excavating Nebuchadnezzar's palace area. And in one of the storerooms there, they come across this little tablet that again is a uh, bookkeeping tablet. You know, how many rations are we giving to this person, this person, this person's family? Listed plain as day on this ration tablet is Jehoiakim, comma, king of Judah, comma. So here he is, he's captive, he's in the household of Nebuchadnezzar, but he's still called the king of Judah. And, and he's obviously there, so for Ezekiel to be reckoning his calendar off of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, makes perfect sense if that's what Nebuchadnezzar is referring to him as. 
So, so again, this interesting sort of fill in the cracks detail that skeptics were specifically using as evidence to disprove the historicity of Ezekiel and so on, they actually happen to recover a tablet that confirms that specific aspect that the critics were doubting. So again, it's, it's just kind of cool to see those l tiny little puzzle pieces that we occasionally find plug a crack or silence the skeptics' attack on this. Uh, Um, it's probably known as the, Jeho the Jehoiakim tablet, actually, but I'd have to give you an exact name for it. Off the top of my head, it's, it's, not, it's not popping out, unfortunately. But, but again, it's in the British Museum. It's actually probably in the Berlin Museum, actually, since it was a German excavation. Um, again, those fragments that we recover are sometimes really impressive. This was a find at Tel Dan in 1993. Um, they're taking apart a wall. Those are the large blocks around it. And the thing there by the ruler, uh, somebody was walking around in the evening and looked down at the side of the, the one smooth side there and said, good grief, there's writing on that thing. <laughs> so, so they quickly ran out and, and pulled the thing out and took a look at it. And this was uh, quite a shock to the minimalist scholars because this is a fragment of the calling card left behind by King Hazael of Syria after he came through and sacked Dan. You go through and you burn a city down and you set up a stone monument to say, oh, I'm better than whoever was here before me and you know, uh, pay your taxes uh, kind of a thing. <laughs> so, so again, it's commemorating his victory over Israel and sure enough, you can, you know, you can read, read the text there, the Paleo-Hebrew, which is close enough to Aramaic at the time. You know, there's the, the king of Israel, the title is, is right there. And then you go on to the next line and it talks about the house of David, the Bayad David. And this made lots of people pause. This is 1993. People had been arguing for many, many years that the house of David, the David myth, the Solomon myth, had no extra biblical evidence for it. So we don't have Egyptian records or anything like that that refer to David. So it must be just a myth that was invented during the exile or something like that. Here's an artifact that talks about the house of David. And the minimalist scholars were really going crazy. Let's see, house of David, oh man. Uh, well, let's see, there's Bethlehem, there's Beth Shemesh, there's Beth David. I bet you it's like some little tiny village off in the middle of no place that we've never heard of. It can't be the dynasty of David that's being referred to here. Fortunately, a couple of years later, they recovered another couple of pieces for it that make the reading much more clear that you really can't get around that. It is referring to the dynasty of David that's there. So this, uh, once again, just takes out the minimalist claim. Oh, there's, you know, David didn't exist. Solomon didn't exist because we have no evidence that, that that ever existed. So now we have artifacts and the min minimalists again have to then backpedal. A major find here that's been going on in, in uh, Israel, sorry, yeah, Israel today, is uh, Kirbet Kayafa. Uh, there is an article on this in Bar just this summer that's very nice. So I mentioned the big problem from the minimalists was there's no evidence that uh, David ever had a kingdom, that Judah ever existed as a nation really. Uh, the artifacts that we have from that time period, David's time period, Saul's and Solomon's time period aren't all that great. Well, this is a, a site that's been worked since about 2007 or so that, that is just incredible in terms of the finds that are there. Uh, a, it dates right to the Iron II period, right there at the time of David, Solomon and so on. So the time period is perfect. And you can see in it features that are the classic Israelite construction. You know, is this a Philistine? And this is right on the border between the Philistines and the Israelites. And the question is, well, is this a Philistine fortress or is this an Israelite for fortress? If it's an Israelite fortress, this gives you some sense of there really must have been national strength to be able to build fortresses like this to hold off the, uh, the Philistines. 
So again, it has uh, some striking things. One is there's no pig bones found. So in the animal remains that you find there, there's no pig bones, there's no dog bones. In Philistine cities, very common to find pig remains all over the place. Uh, Israelite cities, oh yeah, that's right, those were unclean animals, so you don't find them uh, there. The other thing in the construction is that it's casemate walls, where the houses are built right up against the wall. Uh, the, the, the two thick lower layers there uh, that, that open space is used as a storeroom until the enemy attacks, and then you fill it in with rock and rubble to actually strengthen the wall. Philistines never bothered building like that. It's an Israelite type of construction. So what we've got here is, is that kind of hard evidence that there really was uh, enough power in Judah at this time to build fortresses to keep the Philistines at bay. So this is exactly the kind of thing we pick up from the Bible in terms of David's ability to, um, Solomon's ability to hold off the Philistines. One of the other things that's been cool, they found some writing here. This little fortress outpost has some rather sophisticated writing. The actual interpretation of it is still being fought over, but it really does have the sense that one sees of a concern for caring for the poor and the widow and the orphan. Um, again, that sort of biblical thinking where we worry about, you know, caring for the stranger. So again, um, the, the artifacts have that sense of this really looks like something like Judah as we're told about in the, again, in the, during the reign of David and so on. Um, they find these jars all over the place there that are a style that's much common, much more common later. They're known as Lamellic jars, they're, they're, people's best guess is that they, these were used for taxation purposes. Um, so again, you have this sense of, wow, um, David really did have fortresses, you know, the battles with the Philistines were real, and fairly well maintained and supported uh, troops in, those, in that fortress. Other things showing up in the archeological world, this one is, is one that people are debating a bit, um, Elat Mazar thinks that she's found David's palace at the location where it's described in Chronicles and so on, um, just north of some of the areas. And in, in the digging through the, the, uh, the layers here, she found a uh, seal from one of the noblemen in Jeremiah's time, which gives some credence to it. Uh, again, this is a much more difficult site to assess what exactly is going on. That was the nice thing there with uh, the, the earlier site because that was just a one period occupancy. So there's some later Hellenistic stuff, but you can get right down to Iron II and you know where you're at. This is harder to work at, but it has a number of the features that one would expect to see for a moderately well built palace for David and Solomon's time. Again, was Jerusalem the capital of Israel at this time, structures like this give credence to that, to that idea. Uh, I mentioned that you dig up graves. I should talk about a couple of them here. This was a cemetery that was, uh, it was excavated in the late 70s. It's over in the western side of Jerusalem. And you can see there, well, I already covered it up. Let me go back. You can see here how the, the bodies are laid out. Those are head notches there. And uh, this would be a family tomb. You bring the bodies, lay them there for a year. After about a year, the flesh is decayed away. Then what you do is you take the bones, and what's left, and you put the bones here into the crypt. So there's some students demonstrating how, how, how the <laughs> bodies would be laid out, um, just, just for demonstration purposes only. Um, and when they, were, when they were excavating this, Students are down in there. Students are great because they're volunteer laborers. They, you know, <laughs> excavate for credit. You know, and 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 one is one is down there, and and they hold up this thing. It's about the size of a cigarette butt, and they go, "Hey, what's this thing?" And 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 all the professionals kind of close their jaws and say, "Hand that to me very carefully." <laughs> okay, um, you can see the two little holes there on the side. This is a heavily corroded, but it's a silver amulet, worn as a necklace with a string around the neck. And, and it took them about 10 years to get the guts to unroll it and see what was inside there. 
When they did, they discovered that there's writing on the inside of it. And what the writing is, is a good chunk of the priestly blessing. So, so it's not everything there, but it's a nice synopsis of it. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And again, the minimalists are like, oh, that, those must just be some accidental scratches or something like that on the silver that can't really be, can't really be what's there. So, so again, they did high resolution micro photography on it to show the letters are really nicely there and it's scratched in in the order in which you would write it on an ostraca and pen and ink. So it really is writing, it really does say that. And again, the skeptics are like, look, these are priestly blessings. These were kept secret from people until long after the exile. Here it is, right again about 587, 600 BC, that they're recovering this. This is the time period for that tomb. So just, again, this fragment, puzzle piece, here it is, and, and we find it. Let me give you one New Testament thing that's kind of cool in that same category. One of the big issues um, classically has been, when exactly was the Gospel of John written? And again, the minimalists, the skeptics would say, look, the Gospel of John had to be second or third century because it's just way too sophisticated in its view of God, particularly of Jesus, because it thinks of Jesus as God and it, and it uses this very sophisticated, you know, in the beginning was the word, the logos concept from Greek philosophy seems to be in here. So, so this obviously has to be, you know, no one would have thought of this carpenter and itinerant rabbi as God. So, so this took a couple centuries of myth building to actually develop the types of things that we find here in the Gospel of John. So it has to be a second or third century document. Until, until people rummaging through trash in Egypt, and, and Egypt's really cool because you just go a couple hundred yards off away from the Nile and you can find trash heaps from New Testament times where, <laughs> where it hasn't rotted away because it's so dry. This was recovered in Egypt, 1920. It's about the size of a stamp. And what's on this thing is, John 18 on one side, on the second side of the papyrus is, is a continuation of John 18. So here you've got the Gospel of John in Egypt, in Egypt, right? John himself was up in Ephesus or something like that. Uh, has gotten down to Egypt and the handwriting can be quite precisely dated to within 20 years about 125 AD is the date for this. It's like, okay, here you've got a fragment from long before the time that people were saying it was actually written. Again, from the minimalist school of thought for that. So, for the sake of time here, let me flip to the, and see how well my, my ability to go to slide works here. Look at what all you're missing. <laughs> I tell you, this is sad. Uh, uh, oh, I wish I could. Um, look at that, it's not even giving me all slides. There we go. I was wanting to get down to. That's okay, I'll give you the best, don't worry. Um, what, what everyone recognizes, minimalist or maximalist, is really the greatest discovery in the 20th century. It's the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in particular, well, if you were to ask me, okay, give me one book of the Old Testament that I'd like to have for, for, again, verification of Old Testament history and in particular of, of the Old Testament message of salvation and so on, what would that be? Well, it would be either the, well, well it would be what we found, <laughs> the book of Isaiah. Um, I would also like to find the book of Deuteronomy from about 1000 BC myself, but, but nevertheless, this is good enough. This is Isaiah, <laughs> this is all right. And, and what's incredible is we found the whole thing in one piece. In fact, the leather that was, was so good that the Bedouin shepherds that first recovered it almost made it into shoes. Okay, and then they said, well, let's see if we can sell it off as something, and they got 20 bucks for it or something like that. But, but the thing that's incredible, again, is the book of Isaiah and the content in the book of Isaiah here, the accuracy is incredible because the next closest copy of the book of Isaiah that we had was from 1010 AD. 
and this thing dates back to 150 BC. So we have accurate copying here over a thousand year period where if you look at Isaiah 53 in particular, there's only 17 letters different between the Masoretic text that we have in 1000 AD that scholars had been working with and this Dead Sea Scroll. 10 spelling differences, different ways that you might write vowels, all the words are the same in terms of what you'd recognize. The, the biggest surprise is there's noon, the word for uh, light is in verse 11, but that doesn't really affect any meaning in any significant way at all. Again, when they carbon dated this, again, 1100 years younger, older than our copy of Isaiah 53 that we have through, preserved through the rabbis. Again, with that accuracy of copying over a thousand years is just stunning. What's particularly cool with Isaiah 53 is that's a fairly hot text for Jews and Christians to look at. And here we have one that's from long before the time of Christianity being around. And again, at least 150 years or so. And Isaiah 53, to me, is one of the, the most cool passages to look at because this is where Isaiah talks about the suffering servant. And, and if you've heard Handel's Messiah and so on, you can probably sing this, but, but this is basically talking about this person, or is this the nation Israel? Who is this who's despised and shunned by men, who bore our sickness, who endured our suffering, who, who was wounded because of our sins, and by his bruises we were healed. So Isaiah is speaking of we being healed by what the suffering that this servant undergoes says that the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us, and that he was cut off. This is what's stunning with the passage. He's cut off out of the land of the living. That he's killed through the sin of my people who deserve the punishment. So you have substitutionary atonement showing up here. Somehow the suffering servant is killed. Why? Well, well, wow. He makes himself an offering for guilt and yet, and yet he sees offspring and has a long life, so that through him the Lord's purpose might prosper. And, and this servant is a righteous servant, even though he suffered, and he makes the many righteous, and it, he bears their punishment. Again, this is the clearest statement of the substitutionary atonement in the Old Testament is here in Isaiah 53. And then God says, I will give him the many as his portion. He'll receive the multitude as his spoil for he's exposed himself to death and was numbered among the sinners. And what's cool is this is how the Jewish Publication Society translates Isaiah 53, okay? And you go, wow, okay, what, who is Isaiah talking about here? Who possibly in Jewish history could possibly have done anything like that? And it's like, Oh yeah, gee, um, who was this suffering servant? And, and the incredible thing is Isaiah is talking about Jesus coming 700, this is a prophecy 700 years before Jesus actually came. And in particular, we have a direct copy of that prophecy from well over a century before Jesus actually came. So we know that prophecy was not tampered with by Christians or tweaked by Jews to make it less strong. It's very clear what the suffering servant will do and very clearly looks like what Jesus did as well. So again, it, it, it's just an incredible thing to see that confirmation of what exactly the suffering servant would do confirmed long before Jesus actually came. To me, that then is sort of the fun part of biblical archaeology is, is, you know, there's all kinds of fun things you can learn about what people ate and so on and what they did. <laughs> um, but, but to me, the biblical archaeology standpoint is, is, well, just how trustworthy is that history in the stories that we see in the Bible? Because that reflects, well, just how trustworthy is God uh, overall and, and just how real are those stories affects how real we think our salvation is. You know, to get that link, this is stuff that really 
happened. These are people that really lived. To me is the thing that's so cool with it. Unfortunately, we can't answer questions like, was the tomb empty? The tomb was destroyed during the Crusades. So that's no longer around to do anything with. And again, archeology span doesn't give us that level of evidence like Thomas had and so on. It, again, it's playing with puzzle pieces. Just a few pieces survive from that time, but, but those few pieces fill in enough cracks to make it reasonable, I think, to believe the message that's there in the Bible. And especially when you look at how the things that we've found square with what skeptics were expecting to find or not find. We keep finding what fragments we find actually confirm the biblical story when we do find fragments. And that aspect of it, to me, is what makes archaeology so much fun, is like that fortress. Wow, that really nails down that David had a nation and so on. So, so again, archaeology can't prove that Jesus rose from the dead, but it gets you close enough to so many events surrounding it and around it that it's reasonable then to say, no, no, Jesus really did rise from the dead. Jesus really does live forever. And the skeptics have, again, greater issues with the archaeology, I think, than what the Christians are facing in terms of what we're discovering. So with that, I finish before 9.30, that's good, and have some time for a couple of questions even, too. So. Uh, yeah, you had your hand up first. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy about this, but you know, you said that with the Red, the dead sea, the red sea crossing, you know, what could be left behind? And wasn't there some guy who said he claimed he found a chariot wheel? Was that a hoax? Yeah, yeah, the chariot wheel discovery, um, I would say, was a hoax. Yeah, it seems to be. Um, that's one of the problems with archaeology. You know, that's why I showed the Indiana Jones thing. You know, people claim they found all kinds of cool things, and and on closer inspection, they don't hold up. So. That that particular chariot wheel thing, I think, is a hoax. There there, there is some. I've got a colleague who's working on some things for historicity of the Exodus. But if I told you, I'd have to at least kill myself. So, <laughs> so, so um, but again, well, it, it's one of these areas where you, you have to be very careful if you say, oh, there's no evidence for, therefore it didn't happen. And that's why I like the Kayafa find of like, oh, there's no evidence for David, no evidence that there was a kingdom. Well, gee, now we've, now we've found it. So, so it's the backtracking of the minimalists that I find kind of fun in this. But there are areas where it's still, no, nope, sorry, we still don't have anything on it. Wish we did, it'd be cool, so. Other question in the back there, it's you. Okay, I didn't quite hear you. Um, for you as an archaeologist, what was the most exciting find for you? Oh, the most exciting find for me uh, as an archaeologist was, was not finding the snake that was in the square next to me. <laughs> and another group of, I, I did some field work as a student for a bit, and uh, I didn't find anything interesting at all. Uh, that, that's what 99.99% .99 of archaeology is. But the square next to me, they, hit a, they found a snake's liar, and uh, most snakes in Israel are poisonous. So, so it didn't live long after it was discovered, but I was glad I wasn't in that square. Um, <laughs> working that square. Just in terms of the things that, that, that I've looked over, um, to, to me, um, I, the, the, the Baruch Bulla is, is the most incredible. Because here's the guy who you know, took, took dictation, 
had the right had the right to book twice because the king of Israel, you know, king of Judah cut it up and burned it in the fire and things like that. So, um, and and he's even a person that one chapter of Jeremiah is directed to. Forget exactly which number it is, but. Uh, but uh, God, you know, Jeremiah turns to Baruch and, and Baruch's writing it down, you know. It's like, um, don't think too great a thing about yourself. I'll make sure that you survive the fall of Jerusalem with your life. So, but again, just this, you know, watch your pride, man. Watch your pride. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of what God's telling Baruch. But just that sense of, you know, we're able to recover, you know, just of uh, again, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction to find things like that to, to me are really stunning. So, so. Um, and it's after 9.30, so I should probably let everyone go, but I'll stick around to take answers and questions and whatever afterwards. So, thanks. So. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.